Brooklyn. Hello, folks. It's Michael with the CCERP podcast, Eve for Ecology. Hope you are doing well. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about and dig into a little history and ecology of our area, Texas, the country. Um, we are fortunate to be joined with the great Dan Flores, author of numerous books. Um, we'll put a link to those in the show notes. You can look them up, recommend reading them. Um, Dan, could you say hi and introduce yourself to the folks? Absolutely. Thanks for uh, having me on and being interested in my stuff, Michael. Uh, my name is Dan Flores. I'm a writer who uh, <clears throat> lives uh, just outside Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, and uh, I've spent a lot of my career, most of my career as a university professor uh, in a variety of places, one of them in Texas. I was at, at Texas Tech University for about a dozen or 14 years uh, cool. back in the 80s and early 90s, but I spent most of my uh, academic career at the University of Montana in Missoula, Montana, and um, I retired from there about uh, six years ago in order to be able to to write full time. So that's what I've been doing, and it's uh, cool. I'd say writing full time is kind of the ideal life. Huh? Nice. Uh, yeah. It, it, yeah. How, how do you manage that with like how much how much time you're able to actually sit down and write and how much you just like can't take it anymore and got to get up and move around or get brain dead or something well i usually start out the day by getting up and moving around rather than uh, i don't do the uh the old hemingway strategy of getting up early and writing between seven o'clock and ten o'clock i mean hemingway's idea always was he wanted to be done working by ten o'clock so he could start having his first round of drinks but <laughs> yeah. uh I, I tend to to work the other way. Um, I usually spend the mornings out uh, in uh, the beautiful natural world of of uh, Santa Fe County in New Mexico. Uh, I live outside town on on some acreage and uh, have a lot of wild country around me. So I nice. will get up and my dog and I will go for a run or go for a hike in the canyon uh, behind the house or. Uh, do something outside uh, for most of the morning. And then sometime in the early afternoon after lunch, I'll sit down and start working. And I usually try to work through the sort of slack times of the day, uh, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and then when the light starts getting nice again around uh, 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, I'll break off and, and head outside and, and uh, spend some time outdoors again. Cool. So I've, I've got this kind of, you know, and I have to say the pandemic's a great time to to be writing a book because hmm, uh, true. in, in uh, pre-pandemic times, I mean, one spends a lot of time traveling around and and uh, talking about uh, the books you've already written and, and uh, you know, and just traveling for recreation and fun. Uh, and uh, in the last year, obviously, or the last 10 months, I mean, none of us has been able to do very much traveling at all. I mean, mm -hmm. I had all kinds of talks lined up in 2020, all of which got called off. So oh, I've gotten wow. to pretty much stay home and, and uh, work. It's been a, a, a pretty intense kind of year of reading and writing and enjoying the natural world and and not seeing very many people, I have to say. <laughs> Yeah, that's harsh. Yeah, sometimes it's driving me crazy. I think I must have been like autistic spectrum or something growing up. So maybe it's a little easier in some ways, but um, I think I would diet, being outdoors more, put it in remission or cured it or something. Um, whatever the thing was, autism or whatever. And so, um, yeah, it's like different now. And um, I'm like kind of. You know, being a private tutor, I'm around people all the time, you know, tutoring privately. And then when this hit, sure. it was like <laughs> uh, harsh. Um, it was okay for a little while, but man, it started to get to me. It's like, geez, where's my like personal contact? Well, you know, we're, we evolved as social animals. And so we're, uh, that's our, our first impulse is to be around groups of people. 
I mean, uh, this is just how humans uh, emerged in the evolutionary river. We're, we're part of uh, that big component of species out there that live lives uh, in concert with other members of our own species. But we do have, uh, you know, we've had the experiences in our long history of times, and they've often been caused by disease epidemics, when we have to do the fission thing, when we have to break apart and scatter and stay away from one another. And, you know, we don't, as we've learned here in the last year, we don't do it particularly well after a few months. I mean, we start dying <laughs> for, for being around other people again, but we certainly have that ability. I mean, humans are, are categorized as one of the 19 or 20 Hmm. Uh, mammals around the world that are fish and fusion animals so that we we primarily spend our lives surrounded by people but we have this ability to break away and stay away and it's it's been one of the things that's enabled us to survive because we've been beset by disease epidemics a lot of times uh in human history and this is usually how we've been able to to get through them and to keep from being wiped out or taken down to a very small numbers is by scattering across the landscape and staying away from one another. Interesting. I hadn't thought of it like that so, before. Hmm, wow, cool. Yeah, well, that's true. I mean, this is hmm. what, we're, what we've been doing here in the last year with what we are, have been calling social distancing. This is something we have done in across human history many, many times before. Hmm. Wow. I mean, in the, you know, just as one example out of fairly recent American history, in the 19th century when disease epidemics like smallpox and cholera began sweeping through Native American communities across the United States. The groups of people who tended to survive them were the ones who were nomadic, who were able to scatter out across the landscape. And the people who were living in villages, in towns, and who stayed in towns and thus were uh, were aggregated together ended up uh, being really hard hit by those epidemics. Hmm, makes sense. Kind of yeah. like Europe during the plagues. <laughs> but so, um, could you, for folks, discuss this? You said this fission thing. What's this like fission thing? Like, huh? Like what? And what do you mean by that? And um, what are some well, other- fission fission fusion is uh, an idea uh, that I. Uh, spent some time on in my book of uh, three or four years ago, Coyote America, where I was attempting to do a biography of, of coyotes as a species. Their uh, evolutionary emergence in North America, which goes back more than five million years. And what I was really trying to do with the fish and fusion idea is to come to terms with why among all the animals that we were wiping out in the United States 125 years ago. I mean, if you, you know, your listeners will know some of this history. Most people know that at one point we had uh, 25, 30 million bison in America. And by the end of the 19th century, we had fewer than a thousand of them left. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that was just one example of many animals that we almost completely obliterated in the period from about 1820 to 1920. I mean, we lost the most numerous birds in the world, passenger pigeons, of which there were billions of them, and they were all gone by 1914 when the last one of them died. I mean, if they were still around, how could we complain about how we're going to feed everybody? If we had all these bison and birds, goodness forbid, we wouldn't have something to complain about. How are we going to feed the world? uh, It's, you know, it's uh, it's just kind of the story of the destruction of this enormous wildlife resource that Mm -hmm. we had in North America that included the obliteration of... uh, of 15 million pronghorns reduced hmm. down, pronghorn antelope reduced down to 7,000 animals. I mean, and the list just goes on and on and on. I mean, we had we had a Native American parrot in North America, the Carolina parakeet hmm. that we mm-hmm. wiped out at the same time. Well, the reason I got interested in 
the coyote story is that while all these other animals were being exterminated across North America in that 100-year period between 1820 and 1920, coyotes somehow, I mean, we get rid of wolves, but somehow we're not only not able to get rid of coyotes, but coyotes seem to expand their population, and they certainly expanded their range. They spread all over North America at the same time that all these other animals were going extinct. And so the question that raised for me was, why? What, what did they have going for them? And in the course of my research into the biology uh, and the, the uh, ecology of coyotes, what I came to was a recognition that coyotes, having co-evolved alongside larger gray wolves, had long ago come up with several adaptive strategies for surviving persecution and harassment. Hmm. And when we got rid of wolves, and we were the ones who were doing the persecution of coyotes, they just brought to bear those same adaptive strategies. And the primary one cool. was this one called fish infusion, hmm. where coyotes mostly, like us, they mostly are social animals. They exist in packs most of the time. But when we started trying to poison them out and trap them out, and tr basically we tried to exterminate coyotes. I mean, we had a deliberate government policy with mm -hmm. a law passed by the National Congress to wipe them off the face of North America. And they survived it, and one of the reasons for that was because whenever they would be persecuted, they would go into fission mode, which meant that rather than being social animals, they would scatter out as singles and pairs across the landscape. And in the course of doing that research, one of the things I came across was that there are only about 19 mammals around the world that hmm. share that evolutionary adaptation, and human beings are one of the other ones. I was wondering about that. We, what we are some have of the several times in our history managed to escape being <clears throat> wiped out by disease by doing this. Hmm. Cool. What are some of the other mammals that are like that? Well, jackals uh, in mm. Asia and now in southern Europe uh, are one of the animals that, in particular, are kind of famous for having that ability. It's one of the reasons, for instance, that jackals have survived mm. in Africa uh, and mm. in southern Europe, while, just as has been the case in North America, wolves have had a hard time surviving. Mm -hmm. So they the animals that seem to call on that are primarily social animals in their you know their evolutionary behavior they exist as groups but they have this ability to live alone or as pairs at least for some period of time in order to, to escape danger and the the ones that do that um, like us like coyotes like jackals tend to be sort of medium-sized mammals that are what biologists refer to as cosmopolitan, mm. animals that can live in a lot of different kind of settings and can survive in a lot of, a lot of diverse places. And um, evidently, being able to go into fishing mode when you have to is one of the ways that you can, you can survive the onset of real danger. That's mm. kind of what we've been doing for a year now. Hmm. Oh, yeah. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Um, we normally, of course, naturally not knowing the biology and ecology stuff, just think of, um, oh, we're isolating, but we're actually doing the fission fusion thing from a much more abstract biological, ecological point of view. Yeah, and much more, you know, out of our deep time history. I mean, you know, the, once again, human beings, we don't think very much about the fact that we have a really deep history as as wild animals in the world, but, I mean, we do. I mean, we go back, you know, our genus goes back a couple of million years. And um, so th that's just kind of one of the insights about thinking in the big picture about humans as another animal out there in the world is that we've been able to, to do this on several occasions in our history in order to survive. Yeah, it's interesting. People think, yeah, we're doing this because we're so smart. And okay, to some extent we are. People can be very smart. Some can be very stupid. But 
we're doing a certain thing because of our nature. Same thing with, like some people say, um, they point out, why do we have lawns everywhere? Because we're trying to reproduce the savannah. Or like you and others have talked about, why is it 72 everywhere? <laughs> because yeah. it's not because, oh, we like it. Yeah, it's because we like it because of our nature from millions of years ago. You know. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, you're right. That's one of the things that I often find a spot for in my books uh, <laughs> why do we all set the thermostats at 72 degrees it, it, whether you live in edmonton in canada uh in alberta or in tucson in arizona everybody's got the thermostat set at 72 degrees what's the explanation for that well as you were just saying quite accurately it's because that was the ambient temperature of subtropical africa where we evolved cool and so that's what we're used to as a temperature. And the only reason we were really able to go to other parts of the world and survive is because we mastered fire. And so we were able to take fire and sewn clothing with us to replicate the African savanna, even we were, when we were living in, you know, glacial northern Europe or something. And now we don't have to build a fire necessarily pile on clothes we can just set the thermostat at 72. is that what they do in space too i never even thought of it and looked it up but do they keep it at about 72 well sure yeah that's huh. that's the you know we're, we're responding to our evolutionary ambient temperature do they vary the temperature when they're up there in space so like when they're sleeping is it like 68 or does it say about 72 the whole time or what do you know well, yeah, no, I don't yeah. don't actually know. Although I I wouldn't doubt that they might, uh, you know, let the temperature tick down a bit when they're sleeping, which again sort of replicates the drop in temperatures at night that we're we're used to and have been used to for a long time. But I mean, those are the kinds of things that, for most people, uh, who never think about humans as being a part of the natural world or as having come out of nature and out of the evolutionary stream or as being an animal i'm not an animal sorry you're an animal (laughs) sorry you are an animal i mean that's the reason we can catch a virus from bats Mm -hmm. i mean charles darwin when darwin wrote uh, on the origin of species i mean one of the things that he did in those three books he wrote he wrote of course two books that immediately followed on the origin of species a decade later, and one of the things he argued for the fact that humans were part of the same evolutionary stream as all the other life on Earth was that we were capable of catching diseases hmm. that came from other mammals. Good point. Yeah, I hadn't looked at that. And I mean, it's kind of obvious, but I hadn't brought, looked at that as evidence for the fact that we're animals. I mean, plenty of other things, but I don't know, just never explicitly did that before that's interesting yeah yeah well that absolutely is uh, is one of the you know things that characterizes us as a fellow out of the evolutionary stream is that we're so similar to all these other creatures i mean and it's not just all mammals i mean some diseases we catch from birds uh as mm-hmm. well but uh, but life on earth is built on the same platforms and what that means is that we're all susceptible to sharing the diseases that emerge in other species Mm -hmm. and actually one thing i've seen um i have to dig it up to try to find the source again but i think someone thinks that actually the virus might have come from a snake and i think with a dna analysis i think that's what they based it on i'll have to look it up but because I don't think they're 100% yeah, not, sure I, it's a bat, right? It's just that's what they suspect, but it could be something else. Well, yeah. Or what it we, could be it's a Chinese we, lab. Think, it's a Chinese that does <laughs> this in a lab. That's what it is. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, what, okay. we, what we think is that it's a bat virus, but it may have gone through another species or two before hmm. entering, entering humans. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mean, pang, pangolins are one of the possibilities mm. oh, yeah. as uh, one of the intermediary species. A pangolin is a, a sort of an anteater-like uh, animal that in Asia is uh, 
widely killed and eaten. And in some of those wet markets in China, uh, where bats and other species uh, are sold to the public, uh, pangolins are another one of the species that's there. And so there's some suspicion. I don't, I've not read anything in a month or two about uh, what the latest ideas are, and but I think probably we don't have a definite answer yet, but we're pretty certain that the virus itself originated in bat colonies in China, hmm. but it may have gone through another species or maybe a couple of other species before it finally mutated sufficiently to be transferable to humans. And of course, hmm. it also, a virus like that also has to mutate in a way that it not only can be transferred from an animal to a human, but then can be transferred between humans. Hmm. And this virus has, has clearly, it's mastered that bridge. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, it is remarkably highly transmissible. And all the new strains coming out, I think, I don't know if there's a new one, but I think I, yesterday I saw on the internet that there was supposed to be some new strain in Houston that wasn't anywhere else from, like, I think the article was dated 24 September, um, mm -hmm. causing, like, of course, since it's a new strain, causing more um, outbreak. Um, yeah, I think the new, you know, th this is, the, the coronaviruses don't mutate nearly as rapidly as influenza viruses do, hmm. for example. They, they tend to be a lot more stable, but... I mean, you know, given the number of people that this virus has infected around the world, I mean, it obviously has enough hosts that it's mutating and it's changing some. The latest information I saw on that, which was a few days ago, was that, uh, and this may be referring to the, the virus you're describing in Houston, is that there does seem to be a new form of it around that doesn't necessarily make it uh, more dangerous, but makes mm -hmm. it more easily transmitted. Mm -hmm. Sounds so, about right. So it's evolved yeah. in some way that uh, that it's uh, it's more easily passed between uh, between us. Yeah, because I remember him explicitly saying that it's not more virulent in the article. I don't remember the other yeah. part so much. I was just psh, focusing on that. Um, yeah, yeah, that's probably the same the same uh, mm -hmm. same virus that. I read about too. Not more virulent, but more easily transmitted. Well, yeah. Hopefully, it's not like one special one here and another special one in another city. Hopefully, it's like the same one and it's more limited, easier to fight and stuff. Yeah. Well, we'll see. I think you know these new uh, RNA vaccines that have been developed are going to be pretty effective hmm. on whatever i mean you know you never can tell how a virus will mutate but uh so far i think the these rna virus uh, vaccines in particular are going to be pretty effective on it hmm. so they're a lot more targeted to the specific virus instead of viruses in yeah general. and we've never hmm. we've never had rna virus or vaccinations huh. before wow. Interesting. I mean, we've cool. uh, yeah we've always gone a different pathway to come up with a vaccination so I mean, that's why the supposition is that these vac vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna seem to be so effective in the 95% range, huh. whereas the influenza vaccinations <laughs> yeah. that we get are usually only about 50% effective. Yeah. But this is a whole new strategy for hmm. manipulating cool. the RNA of the virus. And, uh, that's, I think, why these, these vaccines seem to be really potent against it. Oh, cool. Then we just got to see how the, <laughs> how the virus adapts. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's right. We'll have to see. That's, that's the way nature works. Yeah. It's like, I have a degree in math, and like as I like to say to people a lot, it's like, calculus is easy. <laughs> you want something complex? Biology. Nothing in mathematics adapts. <laughs> Biology adapts and evolves and changes. Math does not, you know. Well, that's, I mean, you know, that's kind of, that's the way it is. I mean, biology is a moving target. Mm. I mean, mm. it is endlessly changing. And that's, you know, that's kind of, in in ways, some of the absolute charm of it is that the biological world is not standing still. 
uh, it is it's changing under our feet all the time. Yeah, fascinating. But didn't it make sure we got some of this clear? So like fission fusion, fission would be breaking apart, going scattering around, fusion coming together. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And, and so, yeah. So in the fission fusion case. I mean, the normal condition for uh, for humans and coyotes uh, is to live as, as members of a group. Mm-hmm. But uh, and some animals, uh, you know, despite the well, I'll just give you an example. One of the things that we think produced the tremendous attrition of gray wolves when. Uh, the United States, uh, pushed by the livestock industry, began trying to eliminate wolves from the lower 48. And one of the reasons for their attrition, one of the reasons why it only took about 30 years of the federal government, uh, the Bureau of Biological Survey, really making an attempt and all the state uh, versions of it uh, to get rid of wolves was because wolves were not fish and fusion animals. They exist only as fusion animals, as pack animals. And it became relatively easy for government hunters, for instance, to wipe out wolves because if you killed one member of a wolf pack, you could use the scent of that animal Hmm. and lure in and kill every other member of the pack. Hmm. And, I mean, I'll just give you an example of this. For instance, the where I lived for almost a quarter of a century, Montana, when Montana was attempting at the behest of the cattle and sheep industries to get rid of wolves and coyotes between 1890 and 1920. Montana started out in the 1890s taking out something like 70, 80,000 wolves a year and about 30,000 coyotes a year with its bounty program. Hmm. By 1920, 30 years later, in 1920, in that year, Montana bountied only eight gray wolves because they had been basically wiped out, Hmm. but still paid bounties on 30,000 coyotes that same year. Interesting. And so coyotes had not diminished at all in that 30 years because of their ability to go into fishing mode and wolves without that ability had essentially been wiped out in 30 years. Hmm. Sad. Interesting. But and so maybe Buffalo were kind of fusion too strictly. And so that's one reason that might make, made them easy to kill off. Um, well, Buffalo, yeah, Buffalo are definitely fusion animals. They are, they're herd animals, of course, social animals, and yeah, and their res- buffalo uh, and their response to being hunted down uh, by market hunters in the 1870s, 1880s, you know, was to aggregate in ever larger herds. I mean, they mm-hmm. sought safety by coming together rather than splitting apart, mm-hmm. and the act of coming together, of course, made them more susceptible to being killed. Hmm. Yeah, damn. But interesting. Yeah, so that's kind of that's the the big principle of this sort of simple term, fission and fusion, and that's kind of how it works. And uh, you know, because we too are animals, we're in the midst of this this kind of phenomenon right now. Hmm. Yeah, I never thought of fission fusion as being so central to our evolutionary history like that and survival. Um. But, yeah, that's what's going on now. Gone on other times, as you say. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. if not for that, we'd be suffering from COVID a lot more. Kind of more like maybe the bison or the wolves, so to speak. And being more like the coyote, we're able to spread out. <laughs> Even if we suffer psychologically, <laughs> we can still do that. Well, yeah, that's, that's exactly it. So, you know, in my, my state right now, in New Mexico, um, our governor put us in lockdown for the second time hmm. uh, two days ago. She put us in lockdown again, and one of the things she wants everybody to do is to stay home, not go out, you know, only go 
somewhere, if you have to go to the grocery store or if you have to go get a flu shot or just for essential business, but otherwise she wants everybody to stay home. And of course, what that is, if you think about it in the terms of what we've just been talking about here over the last few minutes, is we have a governor in New Mexico who is imposing fission hmm. living uh, among the population here. She's trying to keep us apart from one another and not let us come together. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, you know, whether we know the, the long-term history of, of humanity uh, in, in big history terms and uh, or not, I mean, we're nonetheless doing something that we have done many times before to try to survive uh, things like disease epidemics. Hmm. Cool. Too bad people just don't know more about our animal nature and biology, though. So um, some people are misdoing the stay-at-home thing. Need to get outdoors, need the vitamin D, need the sunshine, need the fresh air. Um, staying indoors is doing something not appropriate to our species, not species appropriate. Um, Americans are already suffering from not having enough vitamin D. That just makes it worse. Then they're more susceptible to being sick. Um, and I think I've seen something recently how um, a good study that showed how vitamin D is important for a good cognitive function too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there there have been some studies that uh, a lack of vitamin D uh, produces a susceptibility to the virus too. Hmm, yeah. So if you're not, you know, for people who, for whatever the reason, can't get enough sun, I mean, you know, and there are parts of the United States that are, by this time of the year, are getting very cloudy and overcast, and and so you don't get very much sun. I mean, the word to the wise is to take a daily dose of vitamin D just to keep those levels up in your body because. Without vitamin D, evidently, you're, you're more susceptible to, uh, I think, to not only catching the virus, but to having a bad time of it, if you do. Yeah. Yeah, and people can look that up. A lot of studies more and more being done about um, death rate in vitamin D, um, length of illness in vitamin D, susceptibility in vitamin D. Um, and then just in general, I think a lot of times when COVID's a problem is because people have underlying health issues. It's not so much the COVID itself, but the um, the consequences of not grasping that we're animals and acting accordingly and doing things species appropriate, exercise, diet, sunshine, lifestyle, um, got these underlying health conditions that make it a problem in something like this. Um, just something we got to learn from, but... Um, I don't think people will learn in general out of this that we need more of that. I'll believe it when I see it, unfortunately. I wish it were otherwise, not to be a jerk, but just looking at the way history works. Well, I mean, you've got a podcast and you're putting the word out there, so maybe you'll have you know, some uh, good effect on, on the people who are listening to Hopefully. you. But yeah, all those things you mentioned are, are definitely, uh, definitely part of, of keeping us uh, healthy animals yeah. and uh, in the places that are sunny like where you live and where I live I mean there's nothing like being out there in the sunshine as much as you can yeah and there's nothing more I'd like to see people in the United States being healthy thriving being their best having a better culture that would be nothing less than freaking awesome or having the world be like that you know it's like you know it's a mat more a matter of wanting to see people really live and enjoy life and be their best and not to like attack people. But you know, the way some people are like they learn something, Oh, you're not doing this. You're a jerk, but it should be, let's like help make people better. Not like cut them down and crap like that. But anyway, um, so that's interesting about just, yeah, human nature, our ecology, how we react to disease, um, how we've done that through history. That's fascinating. I didn't know we'd get onto this topic, but <laughs> I'm sure glad we did. It's like, that's pretty damn interesting. Um, kind of helps us see, 
you know, we can think about that in other situations too. Disease spreading like the plague, what happened when Europeans came over to the United States, Indians suffering the disease, stuff like that. Um, just different examples of the same principle we're talking about with COVID and fission fusion here. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, um, you know, one of the the largest uh, human disasters in all of history is the uh, introduction of old world diseases to yeah. the Americas uh, at the time of settlement, you know, with a pop to a population of of people uh, who had been separated from the diseases of the old world for fifteen thousand years, and in that fifteen thousand years of separation in the old world, we had begun to domesticate animals. We had begun to domesticate uh, cattle and sheep and goats and horses and hogs and chickens and ducks. And from all of those domesticated animals, people in the old world had contracted various diseases. I mean, Mm -hmm. influenza, measles, smallpox, all of those come from the domesticated animals of the old world. Leprosy. And what had, yeah, what had happened in the time uh, before Europeans and old world was finally get to North America is that those diseases had been around for so long hmm. that they had produced, they had killed off susceptible people and had produced a population in the old world hmm. of folks who had some immunity or had reduced to childhood diseases, things like measles and mumps, and even had some immunity to things like smallpox. And the result was the population from the old world in coming to the Americas was a, already a selected population of people who were fairly immune to all these diseases. But hmm. they bring them over to North and South America and Central America in the space of about 75 years, uh, maybe 100 years, I mean, the best estimates are that something like 90% of the native population of the Americas uh, is going to succumb to this whole suite of old world diseases. And that's one thing that's interesting. It's like I think... Just think if they weren't affected by the disease, how different history would be. We fought only 10% of maybe of the ones that were remaining. Even if it was 50, the wars would be totally different if there were so many more Indians. It's like, geez, I don't know if we would, well, you know, it's like, well, it would have been, well, it would have been very difficult to have, you know, quote, conquered the Americas. Yeah. Because as the historians of this have, have stated quite plainly far more native people died of the pathogens on the breath of Europeans than ever died from gunshot wounds or sword wounds or any kind of military conflict. Hmm. I mean, the vast number of people in the Americas who succumbed to the arrival of Europeans died from disease. And so there, in many instances, there were never any major battles. There hmm. were just Europeans arriving and every, I mean, I've, uh, in the book that I'm working on currently in uh, a chapter on the arrival of Europeans in the Americas, I mean, it, one of the things that an early uh, European observer says is that we <laughs> noticed as he put it, that every village we visited within days after we had been there, most of the people in that village, in those villages, had fallen sick and died. And that didn't happen, he said, in places where we didn't go. But everywhere we went, and of course in the the cause-effect idea of the time for Europeans, what this meant was, since they had no idea what the cause of diseases were, what to them this meant was that God favored them <laughs> yeah. and had deliberately caused some disease to wipe out 
these native people and clear the landscape for Europeans to settle. I mean, that was the way Europeans interpreted this. Bizarre. But, I mean, yeah. I was struck by this particular firsthand account mm-hmm. of someone who, who says that every time we visited a village within a few days, almost everybody in that village would be dead. And he said when we asked the, the shamans, the healers, about what was happening, not only did they have no idea what was happening, but they said they had never seen hmm. any kind of infections like the ones that were killing their people. Well, who and was of that? Of course, that was because these infections were all brand new. Which, which explorer was that, do you recall? Um, it was one of the, no, I don't recall. It was one of the guys who um, was in Virginia uh, in the wake of the Roanoke, the settlement of the Roanoke colony in the 1580s. And um, what I was interested in, because the, the book I'm working on is about the relationship between humanity and, and North America's wild animals, I was primarily interested in what accounts uh, these early descriptors were giving of the animal populations along the Virginia seaboard. But so I don't remember, uh, uh, this was one of the four or five people who during the year and a half that the Roanoke colony survived off, off the coast of Virginia, that it was in place and they were coming and they had gone inland. And, um, he had made this comment that I mentioned about everywhere they went the people in the villages were dying in the wake of their visits. So, I mean, that's how wildly toxic these Europeans were. And of course they had no, they had no understanding of how diseases were passed on. They did know from their experiences with things like bubonic plague and like smallpox that whenever a disease hit, what you did was you you went into fishing mode. Hmm. You scattered out across the countryside because if you remained in towns and remained in cities, you were almost certainly going to get infected. Hmm. Yeah. So what people did whenever a disease hit was, I mean, you you scattered. Or as Henry VIII did when smallpox hit England, I mean, he basically locked himself up in his room hmm. uh, in London in, uh, and essentially stayed inside until smallpox passed hmm. out in the city. Interesting. And yeah. didn't, um, do, 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 I think in reading some things about Cabeza de Vaca, um, I think I remember reading something, someone saying that um, Texas used to be so populated, no matter where you were, you could look out across the countryside and see a fire here and there, anywhere. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the wonderful things about Cabeza de Vaca's journey that speaks to that exact thing is that when he and the other three survivors finally get permission to basically leave the settlements along along the coast there between Houston and, and Galveston and go inland, and of course what they want to do is they want to go inland and then to the west to try to find other Spaniards, mm-hmm. I mean, Essentially, what his account says is that they never spend a night camping outside. They stay in a town every huh. single night hmm. wow. because the country is so densely settled with people that, I mean, you don't go more than a few miles until there's another village. Hmm. Wow. And so they stay in towns literally every night. But, of course, you know, in, in addressing what we've been talking about, I mean, the reason that those four guys uh, with Cabeza de Vaca in the lead are able to do this after being essentially captives for several years, suddenly now they're freed and and, uh, able to travel across Texas and the Southwest is because they have, their Spanish shipwreck has introduced disease. And for some reason, then as the natives notice, Everybody else is dying of the diseases, but these four people don't seem to be affected. And so they Mm. were regarded as being supernatural and healers and magicians and sorcerers and shamans. And as a result of that, they were able to travel uh, 
you know, without escorts across the early Southwest in search of, uh, of Spanish towns, which they finally find. But I mean, that's, it's in the context of this introduction of disease. And here are the Europeans who don't seem to be affected uh, while the Indians are dying on all sides. And so it elevates them uh, in the eyes of the native people. So they're able to travel. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Cause I've read that they were able to heal people or thought they were able to people. Um, some of the Indians thought they could heal people. Um, some things like that, but that's a good point that if they're not getting sick, they might be regarded as favored. Um, that would help elevate them. As you said, um, keep them safe. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it did. I mean, you know, of course that, that story is, uh, that's, that's one of the great early European stories in, in North America. I mean, this, these guys who are shipwrecked on the Texas coast, and after several years, only four of them are left, uh, and they managed to uh, to travel, do essentially a transcontinental travel from the Gulf Coast, uh, literally to the Pacific Coast, where mm-hmm. they finally uh, began to find other Spaniards uh, down in Mexico. But yeah, that's that's one of the the great stories. I've always wondered why someone hasn't done a you know, a historical, uh, dramatic movie of it, you know, with uh, no doubt Antonio Banderas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. But there's other good things like that, too. Like some guy, um, black guy was a U.S. Marshal. Um, that'd make a great movie. Um, he would rarely use a weapon. Didn't need to. Just so clever. Very highly regarded U.S. Marshal captured a lot of people don't recall his name right now um or what's his name um the guy that was friends with abraham lincoln oh frederick douglas i'd love to see a movie about frederick douglas um oh, indeed yeah that guy was a total beast yeah. it's like geez self-taught yeah beat up a. there was some pit per guy who was supposed to beat up slaves to control him and frederick douglas beat him up that that'd be a freaking great scene in a movie. But well, Douglas was yeah with Quentin Tarantino directing, you know, and so then <laughs> <Freddie> Douglas could <laughs> he could not only beat the guy up, but he could shoot down thirty or forty of his friends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, Freddie Douglas is obviously one of the great heroes of nineteenth century America. One of my no, heroes, no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, back to. <laughs> Cabeza de Vaca. So, um, what do you know about his trip and like what he wrote about the area around here, South Texas? Well, one of the things that I I have been intrigued about um, is, um, especially given the idea that we have in American. Um, culture when we think about uh, the encounter between the old world and the Americas, we often think of America as this kind of virgin paradise uh, filled with animals, uh, just teeming with wildlife of all kinds. But that particular image of America is really one that formed in the wake of the disease epidemics that wiped out much of the native population. Hmm. And with the, with the destruction of as high as 90% of the American Indian population, that meant that wildlife was able to expand dramatically. Uh, and so those early images and ideas about Virgin America with all this abundant wildlife is really the post-epidemic period. Cabeza de Vaca was Kind of like a movie, like post-apocalypse, yeah. Yes, it's it's the post-apocalyptic period Hmm. that produces this great wildlife above it. And Cabeza de Vaca is our corrective, or one of our correctives for that, because he's there in the 1520s and 1530s 
before these disease epidemics really run wild mm-hmm. across North America. And what he describes on the on the Gulf Coast, all the way basically from Florida over to Texas, and then even inland, in fact, is not a landscape that is absolutely brimming with wildlife. I mean, he describes, as he lives those several years with uh, the the Indians uh, around Galveston Island on the Gulf Coast of Texas, he describes a place where he says one out of every 10 households even has a single deer hide in it. And the only time of year when everybody really eats well is when the prickly pears are producing fruit. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And that only lasts for about three months. And then when that's done, everybody is basically scrounging trying to find enough food to eat so he's describing a situation before the apocalypse where hmm. the indian population is high enough that the that wildlife populations are actually pretty suppressed and the only group of people that he traveled that cabeza de vaca travels through that he says have a huge abundance of of things to eat are basically the buffalo hunting people of the southern high plains and when he gets among those people, he said, okay, they've got lots of goods, lots of things to trade, plenty to eat. But everybody else he travels through is kind of scrounging around for food because the Indian populations are large enough that wildlife populations are suppressed. So that's kind of one of the things that's always intrigued me about Cabeza de Vaca is mm-hmm. that he gives us a kind of a true take on what North America was like before disease epidemics so reduced the Indian population that suddenly there are deer and elk and bears and all kinds of things everywhere. And even when they had the prickly pear, when they're writing about that, I think what the people had to travel to get there too, right? It's not like it just sprouted up wherever they were. They had to travel to get to it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they, you know, and they've, Traveled. I mean, South Texas was, of course, one of the places that they went to to, to harvest the tunas of the prickly pears. But yeah, so the, it was prickly pear season that was the fat time uh, mm-hmm. in those years when Cabeza de Vaca was a captive of the of the Gulf Coast Indians, and that was the time when everybody had enough to eat. The other seasons, though, they they tended to uh, to really not have a whole lot. I mean, and, and imagining. A situation where only you know one out of every ten uh, dwellings has a single deer skin hmm. because deer are not populous enough that people can make use of their skins. I mean that's really quite a commentary on how suppressed deer populations must have been as a result of the the population size of the mm-hmm. of the Texas Gulf Coast. Mm-hmm. What all did they eat? So, because I know in the area now we got swamp rabbit, a bigger rabbit than some others. It's like five to six. Um, marsh rabbit, like in Florida, is only two to three pounds. There's another cottontail out here besides the swamp rabbit that weighs less in my area. Um, deer, um, different birds. Um, do you know, did Cabeza de Vaca or anybody write about how much river mussels were part of their diet? You know, I don't recall that he says a great deal about what they they ate during the the uh, slack times, during the times when the prickly pears weren't, weren't ripe. But some of it was um, so disgusting, he said he wouldn't even write about it. <laughs> yeah, and he... <laughs> And I think because, you know, it was fairly common for Native people to, uh, you didn't waste very much. So if you did kill, you know, some kind of a mammal, a deer or a raccoon or something, uh, people ate everything, Mm -hmm. including the entrails. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably uh, most Europeans of the time regarded that as, you know, uh, as very unsavory. But so I don't recall that he said a great deal, but he did my memory of of uh, his uh, his account does leave me with the impression that he kind of uh, implied that they they did harvest uh, 
the abundance of the Gulf Coast itself, of mm-hmm. what what came up uh, in the tides, and that would probably mean oysters and, uh, you know, who knows, in the freshwater creeks, uh, probably crawfish, uh, frogs. But he didn't, I don't remember that he ever got very specific about that. Mm-hmm. He was very specific about the fact that there were very few deer and, and that the, when the prickly pear tunas came, became ripe, that was when everybody was living high. But I just don't recall that he said a great deal about what they were eating the rest of the year. So I know we um, got um, in the local creeks, um, there are some giant flitter mussels, some, if I'm remembering these combinations of words right, um, yellow sand shell, fragile paper shell, there are some bigger mm-hmm. mussels. They're like, geez, like four, four and a half inches long, can be like three or four inches wide. I imagine that could be, uh, get a number of those, and that could be some good meat. Um, oh, yeah, I, I would imagine so. I mean, and no doubt, of course, they were they were harvesting a vast amount of, of plant material of all kinds. I mean, uh, you know, the native people along the Gulf Coast were, they were hunter gatherers, probably with more emphasis on the gathering than anything else. Mm-hmm. They were not agriculturalists, so they were not farming, mm-hmm. but they were they were certainly harvesting a lot of plant materials uh, and eating all kinds of uh, all kind of local plants that, uh, that that one could use to tide you over. But it, I guess you know my my major point in even bringing it up was to point out this difference between what mm-hmm. uh, the possibilities in North America were like before the disease apocalypse and, and after it. Yeah. After it, suddenly, you know, you have all these wonderful descriptions of vast herds of deer and elk and bison. And I mean, just all kinds of animals are available everywhere. Um, and then over the next few centuries, they're rapidly drawn down everywhere. Europeans establish a town, the primary rule of thumb was that if you put down a European town, you can hunt and live off white-tailed deer for three to five years. Hmm. And certainly by five years out, there are going to be none around Hmm. within reach. Mm -hmm. Uh, Everybody, every town... Uh, across America, this pattern seemed to follow within about three to five, ye- three to five years. Mm-hmm. Whatever wildlife was within the vicinity of the town that you established was wiped out. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, and that was one of the incentives for people continuing to push west and found new settlements. I mean, and it became an incentive for Native people to do the same thing. There were a lot of Indian people who were also migrating westward during the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries because there was always more wildlife farther west uh, than there was from the Atlantic shore, say, to the Appalachian Adirondacks. I mean, that country was fairly quickly hunted out. And then from the Appalachian Adirondack crest to the Mississippi River, that was hunted out basically between about 1760 and 1820. Almost everything was hunted out there. And after 1820, it's basically west of the Mississippi. It's out in the American West. But, yeah, that was the, that was the pattern. I mean, and we just, we uh, Europeans had come out of this tradition where only the elites, only the kings and the nobility got to hunt in the old world, in France, in Europe, in Germany. And when people migrated, when Europeans migrated to the Americas, all those restrictions were gone. So we kind of regarded it as our, as one of our franchises that we got to hunt everything until all the animals were gone in North America. And no colonial law against hunting deer or wild turkeys. No, I mean, the laws were ineffective because there weren't game wardens anyway, but nobody paid any attention to them. We just regarded this as one of our franchises as Americans that you got to hunt animals anytime, anywhere. And it was one of the great struggles of American history, really, 
about a hundred or so years ago to finally get people to accept the fact that it was their right just to go out and kill animals at any time of the year and then sell them. And of course, that's what we did with a lot of the wildlife in America is we sold it on the market. Hmm. I mean, we killed all those passenger pigeons, for example, yeah. primarily to supply restaurants in Philadelphia and New York City and Boston and to feed hogs in the Midwest. Yeah. So it was not just shooting them down for sport or something. It was, I mean, that was what happened to bison too. It was, it was the capitalist market system. And these were resources just like oil is in the 20th century. Wild animals were resources in the 18th and 19th centuries, and so we killed them as natural resources as part of the market economy. Kind of destroying the land, too. Similar thing with agriculture. People would come out, um, tear up the land, put um, annuals on it. Um, then when it wasn't fertile anymore, um, move on to new land, tear down more trees and stuff. Instead of maintaining the animal hus the farming husbandry principles from Europe, even like Jefferson wrote about that somehow he wanted the land to be more taken care of um, each parcel, um, the farm, instead of just being used and thrown away. And so now there's, you know, all this erosion. Still, we got this bad tradition of dealing with the land. Um, a lot of these annuals that are growing causes major soil loss. Um, and that's just throwing away what you depend upon to grow crops, you know? Um, so similar kind of thing with agriculture and farming is with the animals. Yeah, well, that you're exactly right. It's the, it's the same, uh, same principle. I mean, and, and based on, you know, based on migration too, the same thing. I mean, in the 19th century, a lot of, uh, a lot of farmers, it was one of their brags that they, in the course of their lifetime, they had gone through three farms or four farms. They had started in, in Virginia and then they had gone to Kentucky and then they had gone to Ohio and everywhere they had gone, they had in about 15 years or so basically destroyed the fertility of the soil. Mm -hmm. And what do you do when that happens? You just pick up and you move on 200 miles to the next spot and start again and do the same thing again. And then after you ruin that place, you move on and do it, again uh in the next couple of states over so it was um it, it was very much the same principle of you know tracking ever westward to find new populations of animals to exploit for the market i mean agriculture kind of did the same thing yeah too bad it wasn't more ecologically informed but even what um leopold Ad adolf leopold the great naturalist had to learn that himself i think roosevelt some others wanted as you know, something I learned in some of your books, um, predators killed off. So, whoa, hey, we can have more deer and stuff to hunt. And, oh, whoa, <laughs> it's like unintended consequences. <laughs> but. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, lots of unintended consequences. But, you know, we, uh, the American sort of mindset throughout uh, the colonial period, and I mean, into certainly in the 20th century without any question is, you know, nobody has to think very hard about any of this. You don't have to put your mind to figuring out how to make this last because there's a, an enormous amount of it out there. So you just go on to the next place where there's more of it, you know? And so some people after watching uh, the destruction happened in the East and in the Midwest, uh, on the Great Plains, and on the Pacific Coast, they began to realize that, wow, this is maybe not a very good strategy for us to employ. But uh, most Americans just kind of have never thought very hard about things like that. The idea of, you know, of making it economically, of being successful economically was more important than the destruction of the world around them. And, you know, that's ultimately brought us to the fix we're in now with, mm -hmm. with climate change. But um, it's a long pattern. It's, it's similar to the pattern of, you know, 
employing fission to escape being taken out by diseases. It's one of the things that we've done in in history uh, on numerous occasions. And in American history, it's really kind of a pattern that we've we've been pretty myopic about the natural world around us. We just don't pay too much attention to it as long as it's producing uh, and making us uh, economically solvent. I mean, we just don't don't worry too much about it. Yeah, it's just too much taken for granted. It's just there. Well, no, it's not just there. <laughs> if it's gone, but yeah, it's like um, part of our history. It's in our human nature to kind of migrate and move. I mean, that's how we got over here. That's how we're, why we're going to Mars, things like that, going into space. Um, migrating, going to new places. And didn't you say in another podcast that um, when modern humans came over um, to go from Edmonton to the tip of South America, you said um, one hypothesis, I forgot what it's called, um, was it it just took three to 400 years? The overkill. Years. Pardon? Yeah. The overkill hypothesis. Yeah. yeah. Three it's to 400 years to, to go from yeah. Edmonton to the tip and then kill off all these species as well. Yeah, three to four hundred years to to make that migration, and wow. uh, you know, That's according quick. to Paul Martin's overkill hypothesis, on the way, destroying three hundred million animals. Hmm. Wow. But it's you know it's what fueled our migration out of Africa and around the world. I mean, we're we we track out of Africa as soon as we're able to control fire and take that seventy two degree temperature with us uh, into Europe and into Asia and into Siberia. And what we're doing is we're endlessly trying to push into places where other humans haven't been yet, because when you get to those places, you not only find undiminished populations of animals, but you quite often find populations of animals that don't regard humans as a danger or as a predatory threat. And Hmm. so... Mm -hmm you're in effect inserting yourself among populations of animals that are innocent of the danger that humans represent. And those of course are very easy to kill. And so that's how we basically move out of Africa into Europe, into Asia, into Indonesia, into Siberia, across the Bering Strait, the Bering Land Bridge into North America all the way down through Central America to the tip of South America. And those, of course, North America and South America are the last two big continents that that humans discover on Earth. It's kind of the last grand place to go where you can find undiminished animal populations and animal populations that are innocent of humans as predators. And so, I mean, we're able to live really high for as long as the animals last. And, I mean, that's kind of what we did in, you know, in America in the colonial period up through the 20th century is we we lived really well on this super abundance that was there. But we ended up really dramatically diminishing uh, what North America had produced. I mean, you know, I was talking a bit ago about all these species that uh, are being exterminated or are driven to the point of extermination in the 1880s through the 1920s. But if you've ever read uh, a journal entry that Henry David Thoreau made in 1856, Thoreau kind of puts all of that into perspective because what he was writing about was the Massachusetts he inhabited in the 1850s compared to the Massachusetts he had read about when the Puritans had arrived and people like William Wood had written these descriptions of all these diverse species of animals, huge populations of them, that in the wake of the disease epidemic that had taken out the local Indians were populating Massachusetts. And what Thoreau sat there one morning in 1856 and wrote about was he said it was he said it's like a symphony where the french horns and the trumpets 
and so many other instruments have been removed so that the only thing you hear playing are just the strings and the clarinets and all the other instruments are gone. <laughs> or he said it's like looking up into the night sky and realizing that all the best stars and all the best planets have already gotten plucked out of the sky <laughs> by some demigod before you ever come along. <laughs> and so what it led him to realize was he said, I'm the one who's suffering from this. Yeah. I'm that citizen whom I pity because I want to know an entire heaven and an entire earth. And instead, I've got this damaged thing that I witness and am part of. Amen. So yeah. what all those people did who wiped out passenger pigeons and Carolina parakeets and great auks and diminished bison to the point where there were only a thousand of them left and pronghorn antelope from 15 million to 7,000 and on and on and on wolves to the point where there were none left not even in Yellowstone National Park in the late 1920s what they did was they left all the rest of us down the timeline impoverished we don't ever get to experience that the only way we know anything about it is to read how somebody described what it was like to sit there and have millions of passenger pigeons flying over you on their way to a roost. But it's not something that those of us alive now are ever going to get to experience again. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, we've been, we are those citizens whom we pity. And it's, in case some people might think it's just aesthetic or, oh yeah, the experience is nice, but who cares? It's like, it's affecting our lives too. It's a matter of survival um, human survival and thriving that's being affected too. Um, some so-called primitive cultures um, are more advanced than we are in some ways. I think nowadays um, not enough integrated thinking, not enough big picture thinking or wisdom. And I can put some stuff in the show notes so people see I'm not just flapping my jaw or don't know what I'm talking about. Even Gundula Labash, Arturo Casa Duval at Johns Hopkins, you know, one of the best medical schools in the country, if not the world, they find that they have to teach their graduate students in biomedical, not their undergrads, not high school kids, their graduate students, how to think, how to do epistemology, how to do science, um, so they can be better scientists. Um, and they find that a lot of modern scientists are not big picture thinkers enough as they even point out they identify like Marie Curie, um, Louis Pasteur, some others were. Um, so it's a problem they're identifying and trying to take care of remedy at their university. Um, so it is an issue we need to address in our culture, get that bigger picture thinking about ecology and everything into play. So, because it helps us. The aesthetics wow. matters to me too, but it's just so folks know it's a lot deeper than that it is deeper than that and if, uh, if the medical students at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, don't understand how to think critically how to evaluate evidence and don't have a large enough background in the humanities to know who Marie Curie and Louis Pasteur were then imagine what the degree of awareness about history, civilization, human culture, and how to think critically is like for the mass of the American population. Yeah. I mean... I was that it, way, too. Uh, it's not like I'm Mr. Superior. I used to be that way. Thankfully, because of my profession, I've learned being a teacher, seeing what these other people say, what you say in your books. But, yeah, otherwise, I was the same. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, that's... Uh, that, that's not only disappointing, but it also sort of begs the question of whether or not it's possible to actually have a functioning democratic republic, which has to be based on an educated and aware citizenry that can actually work. 
I mean, if you don't have an educated citizenry that understands some of these things, um, a democratic republic gets harder and harder to make function. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so it's a, you know, one obviously can sing to the choir about things like education. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, a former professor, and so uh, that seems to be elemental uh, to making an America that functions. But I think, you know, just beyond my own self-interest in, in uh, the career that I led uh, and wanting to think that I did something worthwhile by trying to educate people, I mean, it, it is a far beyond that. It is one of the issues that America, I think, is confronting in our mm -hmm. own age. Yeah. With 330 million of us in the country, I mean, we just have to somehow make sure that in a democratic republic that's governed by the wishes of the voting population, that we have an educated populace that understands things like this. And I wonder uh, if this will be a new. Don't, you're in trouble. I wonder if this would be a new thing in history too, because what from some books I've read about, like about farming by some folks who know history and farming. Um, one thing I think it's caused some downfalls of some civilizations is um, destroying the land. You know, like Rome can't feed their own populace enough. They got to go other places. The land's destroyed. They have trouble feeding it. Um, but in the U.S., the problem might be something. There's clearly that, obviously, as we've discussed. But another problem might be um, the lack of education, lack of living in a species-appropriate way. Because back then, it was required. You had no choice. But now, all these so-called labor-saving devices, people staying indoors and not getting sunshine, lack of exercise, lack of good diet, um, a whole new set of factors is coming into play that never has. So, you know, I don't know what will happen in the future, but I could see how that could lead to our downfall. I don't know. We'll see. But well, yeah, we will see. I mean, and nobody is able to predict what the future holds. But okay. uh, it, it, you know, what what you can say is that it's um, it's beneficial. It's no doubt beneficial to have your population be widely educated uh, in the humanities, which includes literature and art mm -hmm. and the study of civilization and and in science because science is our best way of mm -hmm. knowing things without yeah. letting our biases creep in because mm -hmm. the scientific method is based around the principle of anytime you perform an experiment you change only one thing at a time so that you can uh, identify the particular element of the experience of the experiment that is causing the outcome and that experiment has to be duplicated by other people before it can be widely accepted among scientists i mean this is just sort of basic science 101 plus ultimately the great thing about science as opposed to many other ways of knowing is that science is endlessly engaging in self-correction mm -hmm. anything that it has gotten wrong it inevitably will bring to bear uh, under scrutiny and it will get changed so that truth is in, in the scientific world is always changing because I mean it's just like you know, the complaints people have made about uh, the Center for Disease Control back in in February and March telling us that, okay, masks aren't going to work. Forget about that. Uh, don't, don't put masks on. Within, by the time we got to May, the CDC is beginning to change its tune. Maybe masks are a good thing. <laughs> now, and I was just reading this morning, you know, we think that when two people are talking to one another and they both have masks on, that prevents the spread of 70% hmm. of virus 
particles between those two people. And, I mean, the reason that changed over 10 months' time is not because the scientists were lying to us <laughs> back in February. It's because they hadn't done enough scientific experimentation yet to determine whether or not masks were really going to work. Well, over the last 10 months, they have done so. And so this is kind of in a, on a small-scale way how science works. And because science is always self-correcting like that, it is a kind of way of knowing the world that you can have some confidence in. It may have been wrong in February, but they're getting it more and more right all the time. Now, five months out, we may have some some new version of how effectively masks work and what you can do to make them even more effective. But that's what scientific knowledge is all about. And the fact that human beings had culture and were able to spread information like that around between us is one of the reasons that we've come to dominate the world. So, I mean, this is just the sort of thing that uh, it seems to me for a successful future of the human species, we have to come to terms with uh, a world where as many people as possible understand uh, as many of these things as they can. Uh, things about history, things about literature, things about art, things about science and the scientific method. And the closer we get to a kind of a realization of that, I think the you know, the better we're going to be off in terms of our survivability on the planet. Uh, because it, it takes knowledge like that, uh, especially as many of, of us as there are now, uh, in order to make a planet that's going to have a long-term future. Yeah. I think some of that's, like, essential, too. Like, um, really getting to know physics or chemistry right in any of the sciences without a historical perspective. Um People don't really see it, how science really works, how it develops. Um, you learn a lot about logic and epistemology and the mistakes people can make. Like there are some books I've read about the history of physics that have helped me understand science a lot, way more than just taking some physics courses in college where it's just memorize and forget, regurgitate. You don't know where why things happen, but like, Introductory Physics by Dr. Herbert Priestley. He was English, Royal Air Force, came over as, uh, I forgot what it's called, interact between the English and American governments um, during World War II, stayed in the U.S., taught in Virginia. Um, very interesting book. I don't agree with what Claudia says about science or the scientific method, but the history of physics is fascinating. Or Dr. Eric Rogers, Physics for the Inquiring Mind. Um, that gives you a whole different take and understanding, take on and understanding of physics and science. Um, then you get to see well, how indeed. it really develops inductively instead of, oh, here's a conclusion out of nowhere, you know. But so that. Well, I mean, phys physics is the, you know, it's the branch of science that sort of pioneered, I mean, Isaac yeah. Newton's. Uh, Principia. I mean, it, it pioneers in the scientific method, and mm -hmm. most other fields of science in the wake of of Newton's Principia. Uh, I mean, they what they sh strive to do was to bring biology and geography and geology up to the level of uh, of scientific precision that. Newton had established as a result of of, uh, of his work. So, yeah, physics is kind of, it's at the vanguard of the, the whole scientific revolution. There's no question about it. Yeah. It's important. I wish, though, in our culture there was more emphasis on biology and ecology and less on physics. Physics is important. We learn a lot from it. But that's one thing I've noticed. A lot of the problems we have um, come from just not having enough biological or ecological knowledge about how to live to be a human. Um, physics gives us a lot of good things, but without that broader context of ecology, we're not going to be successful at living. You know, it's like, cool, you got a well, lever, but why does it matter? Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree, obviously. I mean, that's, that's the, 
branch of the sciences I'm, I've been drawn to. As a, I mean, of course, I've been a humanities guy all along, but uh, I've uh, my stuff has always been informed by the sciences, and it's particularly been informed by by ecology and biology. Those mm-hmm. are the those are the things that have intrigued me, along with you know anthropology and archaeology and paleontology. <laughs> yeah, same. And, uh, yeah, it kind of uh, kind of goes on and on. But that's just uh, I think once you begin, once you develop an understanding of the principles of how those fields work and really of how science works, then you you can read profitably in a lot of a lot of areas. And my my philosophy as a writer has always been uh, I try to go to the field that's going to yield up the best answer to the questions that I have. Mm-hmm. And so if hmm. I have a question about, you know, early humans in North America, I go to, uh, you know, paleobiology and paleontology and archaeology and uh, and see what the people who are working in those fields had to say about it. And what, but, and, uh, go ahead. Well, I was just, you know, just not really anything of <laughs> any grand import other than to say, you know, one one can hope that uh, America has a future where we're, we're doing better at these kinds of things than we seem to be doing at present. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't yeah. we don't seem to be we don't seem to be pulling this thing that you and I have been talking about as a, an ideal. We don't seem to be pulling it off very well right now. Mm-hmm. And I was going to ask, like, um, talking about some of your writings and stuff. So you got a PhD in history. What got you interested in history or like being outdoors from when you were a kid? Well, um, I think a couple of things. Uh, I, my family, my dad's family in particular had, uh, had been in Louisiana where I grew up. I knew for a long time. Uh, I was uh, uh, the eighth generation of my family to have been in Louisiana, which means that um, uh, my family has been there since 1716, so more than 300 years. So I was hmm. intrigued wow. by by that and uh, uh, some of the stories that I heard about uh, you know various. Uh, members of the of those <laughs> generations who were traders to the Indians and had <laughs> gone further west up the Red River that I grew up on uh, to trade with people hundreds of miles up the Red River. And so I was, uh, I think, spurred by that. I was also, uh, I know I was intrigued by <clears throat> the West, uh, which led me to history too, by being taken as a four-year-old on a vacation uh, from Louisiana out uh, to New Mexico. Uh, we went to Carlsbad Caverns and went to White Sands National Monument. And, I mean, as a four-year-old, these were among my first memories of being in these places that were so strikingly different from Louisiana, mm-hmm. uh, where suddenly, you know, there's no vegetation, the ground is white sand, there's this... Mm-hmm cerulean blue sky overhead and those were images that i i had with me for most of my um young adolescence without really remembering what they came from i didn't <laughs> find out that that's where those memories came from until i went to a family reunion back in louisiana when i was 38 years old and i had an aunt remind me that huh. well don't you think maybe you're interested <laughs> in the west because when you were four years old we took you out to and it was suddenly oh my god you're <laughs> right i do yeah so hmm. so those things i think played a played a role and um i think the other thing i, I was always interested in storytelling and a lot of history of course is it's stories and so uh and it seemed kind of when i got to college I was an English major to start out with, ah, hmm. uh, and uh, in fact, I I got a dual degree as an undergraduate. I oh, got cool. a, a degree in both English and history. I added history when I was a junior and and took enough courses to end up with a 
a dual major in both English and history. And the part of history that drew me was the storytelling part. So I, I started out knowing I wanted to be a writer. That's why I was in English. And um, I realized, I suppose at some point along the way, that the possibility for storytelling in a kind of a literary way uh, was out there in, in history. So that's what, uh, that's what I ended up with. And, and it became very, very specifically because of my family's background. And I think because of that early experience as a four year old and uh, out in New Mexico, it became a kind of a, uh, the melding of all those was to tell the story in some kind of literary way of the West. Hmm. And so that's kind of how it all, all managed to merge together into a seamless kind of thing. Now, where the science came in, I think, had to do with, you know, being, uh, as a teenager, being becoming very interested in, in science and the scientific method and, and how you, and I did that as a result of teachers that I had in high school and particular interest that I had. And so, anyway, the result, I think, uh, of all those interests is kind of what I end up writing today, many decades later. Cool. What about the biology? Because, I mean, you could have ended up writing about being like Isaac Asimov and writing about the history of physics or the history of chemistry. Although he did yeah. do some biology, yeah. but why all this yeah. coyotes and American Serengeti and your new book, why all this biology stuff? Well, that probably had to do with growing up uh, in rural Louisiana uh, and as a kid, uh, a pursuit that I continued into my late teens at least, uh, I did what one does uh, in, you know, in rural America in the 1960s. <laughs> I hunted, I mm -hmm. fished, I backpacked, um, I camped all over the place. Uh, as soon as I got a driver's license and my parents would let me take a car, I drove out <laughs> west and, cool. and did some of those same things. So I think it was the relationship that I had early on with, uh, with animals, with, with deer, with, uh, you know, as I write about in the coyote book, one of the things that happened when I was a kid, when I was 12, 13, 14 years old, uh, and was already interested in, in animals and in biology was that I started seeing coyotes cool. showing up in Louisiana. And that was, I mean, that was not only shocking, but that was also fascinating because I knew coyotes were supposed to be animals of the far west, of the <laughs> deserts, of the plains. Mm -hmm. Why were they showing up <laughs> in Louisiana? And, I mean, hmm. and I knew that this was a new thing that was happening because hmm. people who were before me, had, they had never seen these these creatures before. Cool. And so... I mean, that put an idea in my head when I was probably 13 or 14 years old that ultimately led to the writing of Coyote America. Hmm. You know, when I'm in my 60s, I never let go of the idea that, wow, this is something that's really wild and fascinating. Why are coyotes spreading out of the West across the rest of the country? Mm -hmm. What's producing that? And I ended up, you know, writing a book that attempted to explain it. Yeah, good book. I don't know how many times I've listened to it on Audible so far. <laughs> but well, it's a book that's uh, obviously had a lot of resonance for a lot of a lot of people, in part because coyotes are showing up everywhere, and there are a lot of people all over America who, you know, never thought they'd be engaged with coyotes in the yard, who suddenly are finding they're looking out the kitchen window and a coyote is trotting by. And I like but, the way I mean it's a yeah it, it's a you know it's a fascinating animal as yeah. I say in that book. Mm -hmm. Except for us, I've never encountered another species that's got a, a, a story as intriguing as coyotes do. I mean, mm -hmm. they just really have had a roller coaster of a biography through time. And it's, uh, it's very uh, reflective of the human experience, too. That's the reason I call coyotes avatars mm -hmm. in that book. Is I think in a lot of ways their experiences in the world 
have kind of been a mirror of our experiences, and we've made them stand-ins for us. Native people did with their coyote stories, and we did the same thing with the the Roadrunner hmm. cartoons, where mm-hmm. Wiley kind of is an avatar for uh, for modern humans. So yeah, it's a it's a really fascinating animal that I think when people encountered the book and read that story, they recognized the same thing that I recognized in it was, wow, by knowing about this animal, I can find out an awful lot about North America and about myself as an animal species. Yeah. And um, I think that's, uh, that's at least one of the reasons why the book has been successful. I like the way you write it. Um, it's about the coyote, and we learn a lot about their biology. But instead of focusing only on that, you've got their history, their evolution, yes, their biology, their ecology, um, first culture, Native American beliefs about them, um, how they the, interact the with stories, modern culture. Yeah, yeah it's the like folklore. Um, yeah. yeah. Fascinating. That's well, like, as I as I said a few minutes ago, you know, when I sit down and work on something, I always have a lot of questions, and so I tend to go to the places, to the fields of study that I think will yield the best answers to those questions. And what that meant was, with a book like that, you know, you end up reading a lot of anthropology and hmm. evolutionary biology and and uh, history and cultural studies and I mean on and on and on and so you just have to read in a lot of different fields and that's kind of the what informs that book is information from a lot of a lot of places cool how many years did it take you to write that I mean I know it goes back it was like decades in the making so to speak and there was a lot of learning that went into it before you even like sat down to write it but what about the actual like writing when you started finally made a, made a decision to do it? How long did that take? Well, it took about uh, it took about four years to write it, and it probably wouldn't have taken that long. Uh, I probably could have done it in in two hmm. two and a half years, but I was writing it at a time when I was still. Uh, still teaching at the University of Montana. I was still ah. directing PhD students. And so uh, my creative attention was getting pulled away mm-hmm. uh, to help somebody with a dissertation they were working on and so forth. So my my creative energy was kind of scattered when I was first working on it. Um, but about four years, it took about... Uh, I wrote um, uh, chapter... Two first, and that's the chapter that uh, is hmm. called um, uh, Prairie Wolf. Mm-hmm. And Prairie Wolf was the easiest one to get at initially because much of it is about uh, how people who went west in the 19th century, Lewis and Clark, Mark Twain, uh, and others were reacting to coyotes. And the reason that was important, of course, in the story of the coyotes is that unlike a lot of other animals, unlike bears and wolves and foxes and things, for example, all of which also occur in Europe, Europeans had no prior experience with coyotes. I mean, when we came to, when Europeans came to North America, uh, we didn't ever see coyotes until we went beyond the Mississippi River because all the coyotes... Mm -hmm. Uh, at that time, were still in the West. Hmm. And so this was a brand-new animal, and nobody knew exactly what to make of it. In other words, instead of coming at the animal with centuries of stories and folklore traditions the way Europeans did with bears and wolves, we sort of took on coyotes as a blank slate. And so I had all these books in my library um, that preserved these early descriptions of initial encounters with coyotes. And so I started out doing that. So I wrote that third or that second chapter, Prairie Wolf, as the first thing that I wrote. And then 
it wasn't until probably a year later that I finally began working on on the rest of the book. And hmm. by this point, my agent had sold the book in New York, cool. and uh, I had a deadline for it. And so <laughs> uh, the deadline was two years out, and so I had to sit down and, and get serious about doing the rest of it. But, yeah, I mean, the truth is uh, that book is – you know, kind of the work of a lifetime because I had absorbed uh, the information that made it possible to write about the folklore, the anthropology, the coyote stories, about the ecology, the biology of the animals, about the historical story in the 20th century when we try to wipe them out and they're kind of rescued by the passage of the Endangered Species Act. And all of that had come from you know, other things I had written, courses I had taught. So hmm. there were many years of exposure to uh, to the information that went into that book that I was able to draw on. But yeah, about it took about four years in sitting down and writing it. How many books do you think you read to, that went into it and informed it? <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> Hundreds? Yeah. A lot more than are listed <laughs> in the bibliography, I'll say that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. There's no telling. Is I mean, it? I've read a lot of books, honest, but is it pretty much the books that you found out about yourself, or did people say, "Hey, you might be interested in this," or did you have someone like a research secretary finding mentions of coyotes or what? Well, I mean, it's all of those things. It was all of those things. But I will tell you that the <clears throat> the primary, my primary exposure to a wide-ranging literature had to do with the fact that I taught graduate courses to master's and doctoral students at the University of Montana. Hmm. And because many of the doctoral students, of course, were writing dissertations and then going out into the market and trying to get jobs as professors at other schools. I mean, one of the things that, that this gave me as a, uh, you know, as their professor was a conviction that I had to make sure that they were on top of all the latest mm -hmm. literature in the field. Mm -hmm. And that meant, I had to be on top of yeah. the latest literature and feel. So one of the things I did, and I did this for many, many years, um, I don't do it anymore, and, and I'm, I'm happy to not be doing <laughs> it, but yeah. at the start of every fall semester, because I always taught a graduate course in the fall semester, one of the things I did before the fall semester began was I would spend about a week sitting down with all the press catalogs from all the university presses hmm. and the New York presses that published in things like history and anthropology and Indian studies and environmental studies. And I would sit down with all the journals in the field and look at all the reviews, and I would add all the new bibliography, all the new books that had come out since the last time I had taught the course, which had been a year before, to the new bibliography. And so hmm. what that would do was that not only expose my students in the classes to all the very latest stuff that had appeared, but it was exposing me to it as well. And so it kept me on top of the, the literature. I mean, and I did that year after year after year after year. So it meant that when I would sit down to write a book like Coyote America, I was aware of all the latest literature on wolves or coyotes or canids or evolutionary history of North America or, you know, the latest stuff on the coyote folkloric stories and anthropology or, or whatever. Cool. Um, so, you know, and the, and then all those other things you mentioned, I mean, the students themselves were always <laughs> exposing me and everybody in the seminars to new things that they had found. I mean, there are several, uh, books in Coyote America that some graduate student walked into my office one day and said, by the way, have you read so-and-so? <laughs> and 
I would say, no, well, man, you ought to take a look at this because, and I would immediately go to the library and grab a copy of it. And because I would, you, I would trust the students because mm-hmm. they knew what I was interested in as much as I knew what they were interested in. So they would turn me on to brand new things. And there were things that ended up in Coyote America that, uh, you know, that students turn me on to. Cool. So it's, it's kind of that, you know, it's just, um, it's just sort of a lifetime of uh, the happy coincidence of being in a in a a profession that keeps you aware of uh, the latest ideas that are out there, and then being able to fold those into a into a book, and hopefully into a a readable kind of way where people who sit down with the book can benefit from the kind of things that I've benefited from from being exposed on that. Yeah, and that's another, just the quality of your books is another sell for um, the big picture thing or what David Epstein calls range in his book. You know, range, what is it? How generalists triumph, how specialists triumph in a generalized, oh, so how generalists triumph in a specialized world. Uh, right. I think yeah. that's not really it's not really a specialized world. There's no such thing. I think that seems to me just like what the publisher wanted to get people's attention. And it did. It got my attention, but um, I don't think it's really a specialized world. It's a generalized world, but yeah, the generalization thing helps just like, and actually I found out about um, the the folks at Johns Hopkins in that book. Uh, That's one thing that Epstein mentioned is evidence for his hypothesis. Um, But same thing, like, uh, I know on my part, I have a degree in philosophy. And so um, it's like, yeah, I'm like, give me everything. (laughs) (laughs) Math, physics, chemistry, history, biology, ecology, literature. Yeah, And, you know, what that's all based on is uh, being intellectually curious about a lot of things. Uh, And uh, that's a great trait. Intellectual curiosity is is uh is a wonderful thing it keeps you you know i will say i i'm not sure that most of the brightest minds i've ever been around i've ever heard any of them utter the phrase i'm bored <laughs> True. the reason yeah. they don't the reason <laughs> yeah. the really smart people never say i'm bored is because they realize holy cow there is so much incredible stuff out there to learn and they go from one thing to another Mm -hmm. uh so you know anytime i hear someone say something like i'm bored i always think wow lack of imagination (laughs) yeah i just think man i feel sorry for you it's like (laughs) yeah it's like i wish i could give you some of the stuff i'm interested in so you could like and hook up our minds you can go figure it out for me but (laughs) but yeah it's like too much ideas about specialization in the culture um if we knew more history of science, I think that'd be a remedy for that too. Just like Galileo, his dad was one of the ones that studied music and developed modern opera. Um, Galileo knew music really well. And when he first started studying um, motion, um, things falling, um, free fall, when he did his pendulum experiment, one of the first things he did was have strings on a board and he'd roll a ball down and he knew music so well he could sing a song and knew how long the syllables were and he could do that um for some roles or hear the strings as the ball hits him and he knew that um the further down the platform the ball went the quicker the or the longer it took for a sound and so he could he could adjust them so the sounds were coming at a constant rhythm and he saw that the strings were getting longer. Um, and, um, Richard Feynman did experiments on ants to see what made them move. He could play the bongo drums, you know, the great physicist, Nobel prize winner, um, Galileo. Um, he was a great writer. I mean, I've read some of his stuff and it's just, even the translation in English is just gorgeous. I love reading, some of his correspondence and letters and scientific writing. Um, 
Very well done. So that, you know, I'm sure you've you've done this as well, but I will just say for you know the benefit of of uh, your listeners to your podcast that one of the things that has on more occasions than I can enumerate enabled <clears throat> a, a sort of a striking of the chord of interest in the history of science has been the simple act of setting up a telescope, hmm. pointing it at Jupiter, having someone who, and this seems to be true of the vast majority of people, who knows nothing about Galileo or the Galilean moons, look through a telescope and see the four Galilean moons laid out around Jupiter. And then you can tell them the story hmm. of Galileo contriving to invent a telescope that he began pointing at objects in the sky, the moon, the brightest planets that he could see, of course, which would have been Venus, which doesn't give you a whole lot, followed by Jupiter. And when you look at Jupiter, what you see is not just the bright planet itself, but, I mean, and you can even do this with a good pair of eight power binoculars, hmm. you can see the four Galilean moons. And it's the principle of watching those moons revolve around Jupiter that made Galileo realize that Copernicus had been correct, mm -hmm. that, in fact, this principle of smaller objects orbiting around <laughs> larger objects was true of the solar system itself, of all the planets revolving around the sun. And here was the evidence of it. All you had to do is look through a telescope at Jupiter, and here are these four moons. And just having people look through a telescope, I mean, I, I've always delighted in showing this. And I've had people who, I mean, I've got, a friend with a Ph.D. from Stanford and a wife who's got a Ph.D. from one of the universities in Poland, <laughs> who, in, in the case of Jared, who teaches in the Ivy League at the University of Pennsylvania, and they were out here visiting me a couple of summers ago, and I, I mean, Jupiter was hanging like a street lamp in the sky one <laughs> night while we were sitting out drinking and talking, and I said, so if you guys... Uh, have you seen the Galilean moons lately? And they both looked at me and I could tell. <laughs> they had never seen the Galilean moons at all. Had they heard and of them? So we <laughs> did they, did they both, know what you were I talking mean, about? I mean, they knew about Galileo. And I think <laughs> when I said Galilean moons, they began, things began dawning on them. Mm -hmm. But we set up the telescope and sat there, and, and here's Jupiter, and there, of course, are the moons. And they were just open mouthed at it. Huh. And so it's just a simple thing you can do. I mean, Jupiter and Saturn and Mars are all three in the sky at night right now, and Venus is in the southeastern sky early in the morning. But we've got three of the planets that are in the sky uh, this summer, and all you have to do to turn somebody on often to the history of science and how we have figured things out. I mean, in Galileo, I mean, that, that was 1610. I mean, he's not alive that long ago. Charles Darwin wrote on the origin of species, giving us a sense of what evolution is all about and who we are. I mean, that's only a little more than 170 years ago. Yeah. So the whole thing is recent. And if you can turn people on to how it happened, to talk about how Galileo saw those moons around Jupiter, which anybody with a pair of binoculars can see, or how Darwin went to the Galapagos and what he saw there, it's kind of a, for a lot of people, it's sort of a breakthrough, especially people who just haven't cool. thought about yeah. things like this. It's not, unfortunately, it's not the way it's taught. Yeah, if it was taught differently, it'd be totally different. Um, it'd be great. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, all I can say is, I mean, I've never, you know, tried to teach any of this sort of stuff well i mean i take that back i have <laughs> the galilean moons in a class and and have sat and, and 
it's the same thing that I've gotten when I used to at the University of Montana, usually the first class of an undergraduate class in environmental history, the end of the first class of the semester, I always used to ask them this question. Why do you think everybody all across the United States from Maine to Arizona sets the thermostat at 72 degrees? And that would be the end of the class. And the next time we met, two days later or the next week, the students would come in, and I, I would say, okay, tell me, why do we set the thermostats at 72 degrees? Well, I won't say that hardly any students had any idea about why we did it, but once you told them what that was all about, it was like showing somebody the Galilean moon. Hmm, it's yeah. suddenly a Sweet. kind of a, I mean, you can just see a light bulb going off in people's heads. Beautiful. You mean... Yeah. What kind of things would they say? Well, they would say things as an explanation was it was usually because, well, because it feels comfortable. And, of course, the mm -hmm. proper response to that was, why does it feel <laughs> Yeah. Why does 72 degrees feel comfortable to you? And 62 feels a little too cold. And... 87 feels a little too warm. Why do you think that's the case? Well, and usually well was as far as anybody would go. <laughs> yeah. But it was pretty much all or most of the reasons were just kind of what's going on here and now. Like AC is to be designed that way. Maybe some engineer would say it functions best that way or something. But pretty much no one would take a historical perspective. That's, and of course my intent was to make them take a historical mm -hmm. perspective, but it's one of the reasons why I said uh, earlier when we were talking that, uh, we see, we Americans in particular seem to have a myopia when it, a nearsightedness when it comes to imagining ourselves in nature, we just, don't seem to have the ability to do it very much. And if you can help somebody do it with a simple little question like, why don't we set the thermostats at 72 degrees? Or have you ever seen the Galilean moons orbiting around Jupiter? I mean, if you can do that, sometimes that provides a kind of a, a light bulb moment and a breakthrough for people where it, you know, it's one of the great, phrases i had somebody introduce me one time and mm -hmm. say um this guy's book rearranged the furniture in my head and i've used that, <laughs> that phrase huh. ever since it's huh. that's a really great really great term it's the sort of thing that can rearrange the furniture in people's heads for the so better that, from that yeah. point yeah for the better for that point on they never quite think about things in the same way and you know that's hopefully what one does with one's writing is that when somebody finishes what I hope when somebody finishes Coyote America or American Serengeti, um, they, they've been changed forever. They're yeah. never going to think about the world the same way again. That's I, can, hope for I can attest to that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, one thing about Galileo really quickly is interesting. I think it was pointed out, that's my cat talking. Um, my cat wants attention. Um, it was pointed out in some something I read. An amazing thing is, so here you got this guy. I mean, we can look at the moons now, the Galilean moons. We know where they are and so it's la, 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 la. And all about, like, what scientists have learned about the solar system. But he didn't know. So it's like someone sailing like Columbus or someone sailing across this ocean, not knowing exactly where they're going hundreds of years ago. Galileo, he got this telescope and he pointed it in the sky. He looks in one place. And the thing that's so freaking amazing, he was so observant. He looked in the same place the next day and these stars were different. I mean, who yeah. the hell is going to remember exactly where these things were? 
all these stars in the sky and he's looking around Jupiter and he sees these like dots and he has this great way of recording them that he comes up with using like um, maybe like a big star. I've, it's, it's in his book, a big star for like Jupiter and little stars. And he's noticing that they're in a different place. And so he keeps looking every night and sees yeah. there's a different number of them. And they're like a little closer, a little farther from it. You know, it's like, just That's exactly trying right. to wrap and your mind around that. Just the ability sometimes to Sometimes one of them is behind the planet, so you only see three. Or yeah. in front of it, so you only see three. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly, I mean, you know, and it's a very simple thing. I mean, when I first started looking at the moons of, of, uh, of Jupiter, the Galilean moons, I mean, I've got notebooks where succeeding four or five nights, I just, I did... Hmm a big ink spot for the planet <laughs> and cool. little ink spots for where the moons were. Cool. And after doing it for three or four nights, I mean, you see exactly what Galileo saw. Wow. They're not in the same place every night. Yeah. And in fact, you can even look at, you know, at nine o'clock at night and at four in the morning, if Jupiter is still up and they've changed location. Hmm. Cool. And so what he's, what he's of course observing is that they're orbiting. They're going around this larger body. And, uh, I mean, you're precisely correct. When he looked into the sky with his telescope, he didn't expect to see that. He thought he was just going to see a bright light. Instead, he saw a bright light with four objects laid out on a plane around it. Hmm. And mm -hmm. if you do it again the next night, you see the same thing, the same four objects, but they're not in the same spot anymore. And, wow, that becomes one of the great breakthroughs in human consciousness and awareness, that simple act of doing that. Oh, yeah. And then he also, one thing that makes it even more incredible, a lot of people believed before his time that in the heavens, nothing changed. Only terrestrially was there growth and decay. In the heavens, there was no growth and decay, no change. So some people would see that what he did, and would dismiss it. Oh, I didn't really see that. There was a problem with my instrument. I need to make a better telescope or something. It, it was just some weird thing. But to stick to the evidence of the senses and to know to do that, and that's how we get concepts, and to have that Aristotelian perspective instead of the Platonic, that's another amazing thing, to be so observant, but then to like shatter that idea that nothing changes in the heavens. It's like just mind-boggling on so many different levels of what he did. Just that simple thing. Yeah, that simple thing. And, of course, that simple thing took place in biology, too, because at the <clears> time <throat> Galileo was, was doing Starry Messenger, I mean, everyone looking at the world around them believed it was formulated around what they call the great chain of being. Oh, yeah. And the great chain of being included everything from humans down to every other, every animal, uh, every butterfly, every insect, every vegetable, uh, every plant that was on the face of the earth. And the idea was that all those things had been invented, had been created at one moment in time. Mm -hmm. They had remained unchanged, just like the heavens were supposed to be unchanged and constant from the very moment of their creation, they would always remain unchanged. And so the analogy to what Galileo did when he looked at the moons of Jupiter and saw them in different positions night after night was the discovery of species of animals that their fossils indicated were no longer present on Earth, therefore must have become extinct. But that violated the great chain of being, because <laughs> yeah. the great chain of being said everything was created in the beginning. It was perfect. It has never changed. How could there be animals that once existed and don't exist anymore if everything was perfect and unchanging from the beginning? And so it's another one of those where you have to call on the senses, and you say, okay, this is what I've been taught to believe, but my senses are telling me something else entirely. And yeah. that, was, that became one of the great revolutions in scientific thinking to accept the reality of 
extinction and realize that the great chain of being was not an accurate representation of the world around us. In fact, the world around us was changing constantly, which meant that animals could become extinct. They had in the past. They very well might become extinct in the future through the agency of humans. And suddenly, a changing world is a revelation to people in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. I mean, and you have to have that before you get Darwin. Mm, I mean, yeah. Darwin has to follow on the heels of the realization of extinction, the realization that the world has changed. You have to have somebody come along uh, like, you know, in, in geology who suddenly devises a strategy of dating the earth that's many, 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 many times older than biblical texts indicate that it is. Sir Charles Lyell in 1832 writes a book called Principles of Geology, mm -hmm. where he demonstrates that the earth, in fact, is, is vastly older than the 6,000 years that the Old Testament indicates. And with all those things in place, with extinction known, with uh, the age of the earth known, then Charles Darwin can put it all together and come up with sort of explanation for the diversity of life. So those kind of, you know, few little things that if you can just get people hooked on something like the Galilean moons or why we set the thermostat at 72 degrees can sometimes open up minds. Yeah, and real quick, yeah, like um, Darwin was another example of like a range of thinking I was going to bring up earlier but then forgot because I was kind of brain dead. But um, it's another one talking about Galileo and music, Feynman and ants and bongo drums. I mean, Darwin, it's like, um, there's no way in hell we'd be where we are in biology and ecology without a range of thinking, interdisciplinary thinking, integration. Cause he brought in, he didn't just do biology. He had to know geology. He had to have a historical perspective. Um, he had to know butterflies and bugs and, zoology and botany um he got a big idea by reading a book about anthropology which book was that i forgot now um on well human... he read you may be referring to thomas malthus's yeah. essay on on population that's yeah. it yeah 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 um, he had to read he i mean what he had to have in place was a knowledge of extinction charles lyle's uh, principles of geology, which has a, an earth with a vast amount of time for evolutionary change to take place, mm -hmm. and Thomas Malthus's book on population and food supply, which causes him to realize that individuals of species are competing with one another to survive in the world. Mm -hmm. And with that in place, I mean, as you know, it's why uh, Alfred Wallace, independently of Darwin, mm -hmm. reading those same things, came up with the same idea, you know, so that really it's Wallace and Darwin together who yeah. uh, independently come up with the idea of natural selection. But, you know, as Thomas Hooker said in a review of On the Origin of Species when it came out in 1859, how very Stupid of me not to have thought of that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Hooker, when he when he saw it all laid out and realized, okay, good heavens, I've I've read Lyle, I've read Malthus, I know about extinction. How very stupid of <laughs> me not to have not to have thought of that. And what that is an expression of basically is natural selection and evolution's moment had come, mm -hmm. and if it hadn't been Darwin, even if it hadn't been Darwin and, and Alfred Wallace, it would have been somebody else within probably the next five or ten years. Somebody else would have, reading those same pieces of information, somebody else would have come up with the explanation for natural selection. But one of the things I've always marveled at with Darwin is that Darwin returns from the voyage of the Beagle five years he is 28 years old, 
And within a year after getting back from the voyage of the Beagle, he has sat down and thought hard enough about everything he has, he has seen and done that he realizes at 28, he has the epiphany of natural selection. But it's like 1835, and he doesn't write this book until 1859. So for a period of something like 25 years, Charles Darwin, at a young age, knows something nobody else in the world knows. And he sits on it because, as he told a friend as he was getting ready to publish on the origin of species, I feel like I'm admitting to a murder. <laughs> yeah. It will, yeah. It, I know the explanation for the diversity of life. And once I tell everybody, it's going to be like confessing a murder. <laughs> it's it's going to be, it, we're never going to be able to go back to the old way that we thought about who we are as some special exceptional creation that's different from all the rest of the life of life on earth. And uh, so, you know, that, that's kind of, uh, that's always left me a little breathless that this guy knows something nobody else in the world knows for 25 years, except Alfred Wallace and Wallace didn't come to it until the early 1850s. So Darwin has at least about 20 years where he realizes, man, I know something about, about the planet and about life and nobody else knows it. And if I tell them, it's going to be like confessing to a murder. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like Newton. He waited a long time, too. People had to get him, come on, publish, publish, publish your Principia. No. Yeah. So he sat on that for a long yeah. time, too. What He was like, I don't know, 18, 21. It was like over two summers or something during a plague in London, sent home from Cambridge, that he did all his work. I mean, imagine discovering what he did about light and gravitation in like two summers when you're at home. It's like, God, genius. Yeah, it's, it's Principia is a work of genius. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. But, yeah. oh, and then in regard to interdis interdisciplinary thinking and the importance of range, it's like, yeah, like, uh, and then we get into biology. Um, besides and Linnaeus. Yeah, besides the things we mentioned, we get in chemistry, physics, mathematics, um, all that stuff informs it nowadays. Um, and again, no way in hell would we know without that interdisciplinary thinking. Um, but yeah. Um, so no, That's exactly it. So speaking of interdisciplinary thinking, I've got a book to work on. So <laughs> okay, you and I have yeah. been talking for a couple of hours here, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, my cat's getting hungry. I keep having to put my podcast recorder into mute to try to not have him dominating the conversation too much. So I better yeah, feed well, him your, and feed myself. Your cat is hungry, and, and I've got a book. I've got Wild New World to work on. So, uh, wow, what a wide-ranging conversation. I don't know that I've had any <laughs> podcasts that have covered this kind of ground cool yeah, it was great i loved it it's like not what i intended to discuss but um you gotta adapt it was great it's like um didn't expect it it was awesome but uh well, that, yeah excellent could you tell folks really quickly about your book like a minute or two and you got a minute or two to tell them about your book and then we'll sign off or how's things looking yeah, so uh, you want me to talk a little bit more about Coyote America? Um, well, um, either that or Wild New World, whichever you prefer. Or Wild New World? Sure. Shh. Well, Wild New World, is that's the, that's the one I'm about to go, uh, <laughs> go and work on. I'm working on, it's a, it's a book of 10 chapters, and uh, I'm working on chapter 8 right now. So hmm. seven chapters plus the introduction uh, are done, and in fact, cool. they're off to my editor in New York. Um, so I've got three more chapters to do. I'm working on chapter eight. I mean, essentially, the full title of the book is Wild New World, Humanity Encounters America's Animals. And what a title that broad implies mm -hmm. is just what you would think. This cool. is a big history 
uh, spanning uh, large amounts of time of how North America is populated by the species of birds, animals, and reptiles. Uh, I don't do much in by way of insects and hmm. and uh, and other species, but particularly birds and and mammals uh, is sort of my focus. Mm -hmm. How North America is populated by not all of the obviously all the mammals and all the birds that end up in North America, but what I try to do is write a book that focuses on the ones that become important in the human story. And so among the birds, of course, uh, things like ivory bill woodpeckers and passenger pigeons and snowy egrets and um, the great auk and uh, creatures like that. And among the mammals, of course, the canids, the wolves, the coyotes, uh, the ungulates, the uh, bison and elk and sheep, wild sheep and deer and um, animals like beavers and uh, otters, particularly uh, sea otters, because they play such a large mm -hmm. role in the in the fur trade story. Mm -hmm. um, so what I do with the book essentially is this: it starts with the uh, the Chickasaw impact of the meteorite that wipes out the dinosaurs. Hmm. And I started that far back because what I try to do in the first chapter is to explain how through indigenous evolution of a few families of animals, for example, the horses, the camels, the canids, all evolve in North America in the wake of the, of the chick's love impact. And they then, having evolved in North America, end up spreading around to the rest of the world. But in the subsequent 66 million years down to the time 15,000 years ago when humans come out of Africa and out of Europe and Asia and end up arriving in North America, I track the migration of all the other major species that become part of the bestiary that humans encounter. And so creatures like woolly mammoths and mastodons and bison and bears and the big cats and on and on, including some of the major bird species, I track how those all get to North America over time. And that's the, cool. the first chapter, uh, kind of a, a prologue in deep time, I call it. And then the second chapter commences with the arrival of humans. And by the way, in that first chapter, I also track our emergence as a wild animal, our humans' emergence as a wild animal in Africa and how we began spreading out of Africa mm -hmm. so that we're poised to enter North America. And in the second chapter, I have us come here 15,000 years ago, and the second chapter is called Clovisia the Beautiful, and it's about all these early cultures in North America and their encounters with the animals of the Pleistocene when there are still mammoths and saber-toothed cats and, uh, and horses and camels and all these creatures, ground sloths and so forth in North America and what happens when early humans encounter this Pleistocene bestiary, of course, that's never seen human beings before and is completely innocent of human beings. And then the third chapter, uh, which is called uh, Coyote and Ravens America, is about the 10,000 years after the end of the Pleistocene when native people end up occupying every bioregion uh, of North America and do and spend 10,000 years sort of uh, becoming inhabitants of North America and what their relationship with uh, is with the animals of North America in the period after the Pleistocene extinctions because in the subsequent 10,000 years, of course, there are no saber-toothed cats, no mammoths, no mastodons, not even any horses are left. And so hmm. I track that story in the third chapter. And then the fourth chapter starts with the colonization experience of old world worlders coming to North America and bringing their diseases and bringing their domesticated animals and bringing this 
this uh, religious mindset with them that posits that humans are separate from all the rest of creation and all the rest of creation is here for humans to exploit. And they basically, old worlders, convert all the animals of North America into commodity resources in the global market economy. So they basically, uh, you know, began to kill things like wild turkeys and beavers and white-tailed deer and coax the remaining native people into participating in this destruction of America's wildlife in order to turn them into market commodities for the global economy. Hmm. And so the chapters then go from there. You know, I mean, I talk about, uh, I carry the story into the American West. And I talk about, of course, all the naturalists, uh, the Alexander Wilsons, the Lewis and Clark, the hmm. John James Audubons, uh, all the people who are the major naturalists in early America who participate in the discovery of all these creatures and uh, sort of the beginnings of an ecological understanding of America. Cool. And the story is going to take us right down into the 21st century where we're, of course, uh, in the beginning phases of a sixth extinction where we're causing as a result of climate change and uh, perpetuation of a market economy and a rising population of humans, we're precipitating a whole new extinction scenario. So it's a, hmm. it's a big picture story from 66 cool. million years ago down to the present day. And it'll all be done in a book. It's going to be a little bit bigger book than Coyote America. Coyote America was just short of 300 pages. This book may be something like 350 pages or so, hmm, cool. but it's not going to be some mammoth thing. I mean, the whole idea is to make this a readable story yeah. with a lot of stories in it so that, I mean, there are a lot of things out there to read. Uh, what one hopes is that one can write a book that's intriguing enough that among all the possibilities for sitting down with a book, <laughs> this would be one that you would sit down with and you wouldn't put it away for something else. You'd stay with it cool. and yeah. track the story all the way through 66 million years. Interesting. So, yeah, that's what uh, that's what I'm working on. As I said, I'm on the on chapter eight of it now. So there are three chapters left. It's it's supposed to go to my my press, which is W. W. Norton in New York. Uh, in June, hmm. which means that it'll be out sometime in 2022. Cool. Good. Is it going to be on Audible right away, or is that going to take a little longer? <laughs> well, who knows? I love Audible. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I have no idea. I mean, presses always like to publish, you know, a cloth True. edition first. Yeah. And uh, and then all the other forms uh, over time. And uh, so Audible editions and CD versions and <laughs> Kindle editions and paperback editions, all those things usually follow within the first year hmm. or so in a, a fairly regular progression. Cool. Now, weren't there species of hominid in the United States before Homo sapiens? Well, there was. I mean, Homo sapiens are the only ones that have ever been in North America. Oh, I thought there I mean, were others. I thought I read that, but... no. No, Neanderthals went extinct 40,000 years ago. And so Neanderthals were the last other group. Uh, Neanderthals and Denosovans were the last two groups in our genus, but different species, um, that were still around. But those both disappeared 40,000 years ago. Now, there was an archaic form of human that was still around on an island or two in Indonesia. It looks like maybe as recently as 15,000 years ago. But hmm. the only humans that have ever been in North America uh, are Homo sapiens. What about pre-hominids? Uh, Haven't been there some, been, been, some of them been here like a few hundred thousand years ago or something? Not in North America. Huh. I mean, in Europe. I mean, Homo heidelbergensis got into Europe about uh, 800,000 years ago, hmm. uh, and probably into Asia too, but certainly into Europe. Heidelbergensis uh, fossils have been found in several different places in, in uh, Europe. But now none of the 
antique species ever made it to North America. North okay. America and South America are the last continents hominids ever get to. Hmm. And and we don't find them until 15,000 years ago. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. I mean, you know, so there so I will say this, there are of course some paleoanthropologists out there who are flirting with the ideas of of Homo sapiens having gotten to North America at least to Alaska maybe as long ago as 25,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. But as far as coming down into the lower 48, I mean, it's looking like 15, 16,000 years ago is as early as we can justifiably claim that uh, any humans got here. And those were all Homo sapiens by that point. There weren't any more of the antique yeah. okay. uh, groups left. Yeah, I mean, uh, Neanderthals and Denosovans got into Europe uh, and they got into Asia, but uh, but they never got across, you know, the Bering Land Bridge. Okay, I thought I had seen something like that on the internet, but I'll have to look it up and see if I can find anything again. I could very yeah, well be it's wrong. Just, it's happened before. Yeah, it's just <laughs> it's just early versions of, of Homo sapiens, and it's, so it's all the same. It's all our species. It's hmm. basically okay. us. Cool. We're the only only hominid that uh, that ever got to see North America. All right, last thing. Great minds want to know. At least this one does. <laughs> well, I shouldn't yeah, say great. Well, at least a, a mind question. wants to know. Not a great one, but a mind. So that's a, when you run, how far do you yeah, run? How far do you run when you go uh, out? You know, I'm not a, I'm not a real long-distance runner anymore. I do <clears> three <throat> miles, but I'm really consistent with it. I, do, uh, I run every other day, and I do weights on the, cool. on the days in between. So every other day, I run three miles. And the, the actual uh, – physical uh event that i do is about a five mile event because i cross the canyon Hmm. behind my house and climb up on the mesa on the other side and run my three miles over there and it's about a mile to get over there and about a mile to get back to the house life's rough so (laughs) it's a yeah it's a mile of a canyon cool uh traverse gorgeous uh both before and after uh and then three miles of running is it flat or kind of like up and down a bit? Uh, it's pretty flat over on that mesa. It's yeah. a, it's a pretty oh, yeah. piece of Duh, level mesa. ground. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah one <laughs> direction is slightly uphill, but yeah, it's mostly mostly level. What kind of pace? Six minute mile, ten minute mile? No, I don't. I don't run that that fast anymore. I probably I haven't actually checked in a long time, but uh, I don't think I'm going any faster than nine minutes. For yeah, sure. yeah, that's what I do a lot. It's just go out there at efficient pace. I'm not there for time, not like some like 18 year old. Go go go! It's like I just want to move through the environment, pay attention to nature, see things, be alert for a snake. I might see to take a video of it or whatever. Exactly. See some feathers. Like yeah. I saw some running along on one trail. I caught in my peripheral this pattern, and from experience, I know bam feathers. Stop. Come back. Found um, two secondary eastern screech owl feathers. Gray morph. Looked around a bit, so I stopped my run for like 10, 15 minutes to try to find feathers. Got two more primary wing feathers. Um, otherwise, yeah, some people would not care, and they're just, run, 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 run back. But I do it in park to explore, so 8 to 10 minute miles, be efficient, make it feel like it's not much. Um, I do that a bit too. Yeah, well, I mean, I what I like is, not having it be onerous yeah so that if it, if it becomes onerous you start coming up with excuses <laughs> yeah. not to do it true so yeah so a three mile run is you know that that puts up no dread in front of you i mean you know that's just nothing but fun mm-hmm. and so uh i mean i used to run five miles but I've I've cut it back to three because of that very thing. Because with three miles, I mean, there's you know you don't ever have any excuse not to do it because <laughs> running three miles is just fun. Yeah, yeah. I even say that on Facebook yeah, so sometimes. Like I yeah. went on a run just for enjoyment and enrichment. So. Yeah, that's it. Cool. Exactly. So. All right. And of course, it's the fountain fountain of youth, dude. Yeah, true. Like I talked to, um, dang, think of his name right, Baron Heinrich. Um, the biologist. Oh, yeah, sure. He's yeah. 
like he still runs. He's eighty. He said that um, everyone he knows, he everyone he knows who doesn't exercise has said like hip and knee problems, but he's just fine. Um, That's exactly the way I am. Same thing. You know, I don't know no, what he does. No problems miles. at all. It's because yeah. well, it's because we evolved to be runners. I mean, True. that's what we're supposed to do right from <laughs> the very end. Yeah. So it's just, it's once again, it's, it's <clears> thinking <throat> like, uh, you know, a paleolithic. I mean, we evolved to do this. And so that's what, what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to sit around on the couch and watch television for nine hours a day. We're supposed True. to be doing physical things. Yeah. No biology, no ecology. That's K N O W, not N O. Okay. So <laughs> be true that's to your true. nature. Yeah. Cool. Well, Michael, I've enjoyed it, man. It's been a wide range of conversation. Yeah, awesome. I loved it. Thanks for staying a little over, asking, answering a few questions. But get All back right. to your yeah, book. You well, we need to read it. So, okay. Well, Thanks. I need to write it first. So <laughs> let me yeah. get to work on. It. Cool. All right. Have a good day. Thanks. All right, guy. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.